All right. Okay, well, welcome everybody to our third and final Go NAPO Month Ask an Expert webinar series. Um, we're waiting here for our Facebook audience to join us. Um, so I think this is going to be a great Sorry. webinar today. Just a Can you few... give me a uh, host there, Heather? So I can give me the option there. Sorry, Brian, say that again. Uh, could you give me host? Oh, uh, yeah. Let me see. Go to participants and... Got it. Are you, you get it, Brian? Yep. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Great. So just a few housekeeping things. Um, as always, the Q and A will be at the end. The Q and A will be at the end and please submit any questions that you have into the chat or the Q&A section at the bottom. And then also, um, since this is a NAPO presentation, there will be three code words to listen for. And at the end of this presentation, you are welcome to submit those and I'll share my email in the chat and we can share a certificate of attendance for those. Um, if you missed our last two Go NAPO Go Month webinars with Celie Cauley, the paper cleanse, and John De Kohlberg with managing categories, we can get those recordings to you. You can still get a certificate of attendance, um, and I can email them, or you can find them on Maxwell's resource page. Um, today, I would like to welcome Diane Quintana and, jo and also John Beatty with Release, Repurpose, Reorganize. They are going to be presenting to us on how did I end up with so much stuff and what to do about it. So we are excited to have them here. Um, so now I am going to let them take it away. Um, and we have a quick poll, I think, just to start with. So welcome, everybody. So. Hi. Um, shall I take the poll down, Heather, so I can access this? Uh, let's see, everybody have a chance to, we'll do kind of a 10, 8, 9, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, take it down. Okay. My counting skills. All right. Ah, now my, um, I think you have to make me, oh, oh there we go. Thanks. Oops back. Sorry. Um, I'm Diane Quintana, and this is John Beatty. Before we begin our program today, I want to tell you a little more about us. We have lots in common, probably more than you think. We are both professional organizers. We were both teachers before we launched our professional organizing businesses. I was a primary school teacher and Jonda, who has her master's in education, was a special education resource teacher. I started my business, DNQ Solutions, in 2005. Jonda started her organizing business, Time Space Organization, in 2006. We are both mothers to two sons. We each have two grandchildren, a grandson and a granddaughter, and coincidentally, these children were born within months of each other, and they are such a blessing. 
John Doe and I met at a NAPO in the Schools program here in Atlanta in 2007. We became fast friends and have worked with many clients together. It's this friendship and our love of learning which prompted us to write our first two books together. Susie's Messy Room and Benji's Messy Room are sweet children's stories which teach children how to pick up their rooms. In 2020, we decided to create, release, repurpose, reorganize as a joint business. And then we wrote a book about the reasons homes become so full of stuff. It's called Filled Up and Overflowing, What to Do When Life Events, Chronic Disorganization, or Hoarding Go Overboard. That's what our program today is about. We're going to answer the question, how did I end up with so much stuff and what to do about it? And before Jonda begins, I'd like to give you the first code word. The first code word is stuff, S-T-U-F-F, -F, stuff. So where did it all come from? You go to the grocery store, you have your list, and you stop at the kiosk on the way in just to see if there might be a coupon or two that you could use today. And you see some, but you also notice that there is a recipe up there for chicken. And it looks good and easy. So you grab that. And you also see one for salmon and you think that looks good too. So you grab that and you put it in your purse. You go into the grocery store and you start your shopping up and down the aisles and you come to the end of one aisle and there is this table. It's a discount table. And they have got stuff on there still from the holidays, plus some foods that they're highlighting. And they are practically giving this stuff away. You look it over and you think, it's all new. I can use some of this next year. I can, if I don't use it in my decorating, it could be hostess gifts. You start loading up your cart with some of that. You also see a food item that you're specializing. You think, yeah, let's try that. Then off you go to check out. You're checking out. You put all your food on the conveyor belt and you look up and there's this magazine. How to organize your kitchen in 10 easy steps. And you think, oh, wow, got to have that. So you put it on the conveyor belt. Check out, get your receipt, put it in your purse, and off you go. Now, that afternoon, you have a doctor's appointment. And while you're checking in at the doctor's and while you're waiting, you, you notice they have some brochures. And you see one that says, how to exercise and lose weight. Oh, hey, that, that looks, I'll look at that. And then there's one that's everything you should know about your thyroid. And you think, maybe... Maybe I should read that. So you get those two and you go sit down and about the time you want to look at them, they call you back. So you put those in your purse. The next morning you get a call. It's from a friend of yours that you haven't seen for quite a long time. And she says, you know what? I'm in your neighborhood. Have you got a minute so I can stop in? Maybe we could have some tea. And you look at your schedule and you think, I haven't seen her in a long time. Yes, I can work this out. Come on over. So a little bit later, she knocks on your door. You open the door and she's standing there with a package. And she says, surprise, I have a gift for you. You're going to love it. Open it up. It's a teapot. And we both love tea. And it's, it's in the shape of a cat. And we both love cats. And you say, Thank you. Now, in a couple of days, you have brought in a lot of stuff that you never really intended to get. Things also come into our homes as furniture or furnishings. You know, the little tchotchkes or knickknacks. I want to give you a tour through my house because almost all of my furniture comes from a variety of family members. My living room furniture was originally from my father's bachelor apartment. My mother gave it to me when I was moving into my first apartment. 
she said it gave her a really good excuse to redecorate. The desk in my bedroom I took with me when I left home to go to that first apartment. It's always been my desk. I have fond memories of sitting there struggling over math back, not so much. The bedside table were originally in my great grandmother's home. When my, when my mother, when my great grandmother passed away, my father put those bedside tables in our guest room. Then when my siblings and I were emptying my father's house, I thought that I really liked those bedside tables and they would look great next to my bed. So that's how those ended up in my house. The chest of drawers, in my guest room was my great grandfather's. It has the shaving stand with an oval mirror attached to the top of it. And it's really quite something. There's another large chest of drawers in the bonus room that I use to hold wrapping paper and ribbon. I can't remember which family member gave that to me, but that's okay. So the furniture that is scattered all over my house has come to me from a variety of family members and it is incorporated into my interior design. Then I have some small porcelain animals, hand, you know, painted China animals. I can remember as a young girl standing in my grandmother's entryway, these little animals were behind um, glass in a cabinet right there in the front of her house. I spent hours staring at those animals, making up little stories about them, you know, the way small children do. And when my grandmother passed away, my mother knew that I loved them. And so she packed them up and sent them to me. I have them on the mantle over the fireplace in my living room. The interesting thing about all of this furniture and these little knickknacks that I've acquired over the years is that it is, as I said, incorporated into my interior design. Let's talk about children. We know that you can't even bring a baby home from the hospital without a car seat. So there are all sorts of things that you bring into your house as a result of the children car seats, a high chair, a crib, a changing table, and hopefully these things move out of the house when the children outgrow them. But what about the things children leave behind when they move out of your house? I'm a little ashamed to admit that my children use my house as their personal storage facility for a number of years. I had textbooks, yearbooks, trophies, some clothes and sports equipment for practically every sport known to man. Both of my boys played hockey. And if you know anything about ice hockey, you know that this sport comes with a lot of pads. And then there are the hockey sticks and the pucks and of course the ice skates. So um, even when I was taking my boys to hockey games, the two duffel bags with their hockey equipment would take up the entire back of my car. So you can imagine what they would do to a storage closet. One of my boys is a sailor and um, he was a good sailor. So he won a lot of trophies, but did he take those trophies with him when he left the house? No, he did not. The other boy is a snowboarder, skateboarder and skier. He left whichever whichever of those equipments that he wasn't using at the time behind in his closet. So you get the picture, right? I asked them after a number of years had gone by if they wanted all of these things, the clothes, the sports equipment, the trophies, the yearbooks, the textbooks, and their answer was no. So I either donated or recycled or trashed these things. So what about hobbies? I have three hobbies that I actively pursue. I am a gardener, I love to needlepoint, and I'm a ballroom dancer. My gardening supplies are in the garage. 
The extra threads from my finished needle points are in two carts that I have here in my office. And my ballroom dance shoes and costumes are in a small closet that I have dedicated to that hobby. My husband, on the other hand, has a fabulous collection of model, a model trains. Um, he had a huge train table set up in the basement of his mother's house, which she kept up. And when we would go to see her, our boys played with these model trains. And my husband loved showing off all of these trains and the accessories. But when his mother passed away and he and his siblings emptied the house, my husband packed up all these trains and accessories, put them in their little boxes, packed a big box, and you guessed it, all these things landed in a storage closet in our house, where they are to this day. He has wonderful memories of these trains and accessories, and I am encouraging him to let someone else make wonderful memories with these things, but he's not there yet. One of my clients was into knitting at one point in her life, and another client was into scrapbooking. Both of these hobbies have multiple accessories. My knitting client had skeins of yarn, lots of patterns and needles, she had stopped knitting some time ago and was thinking of picking it up again. The other client had stickers, pretty papers, scissors, and binders for all of her scrapbooking projects. She's well-intentioned, but doesn't have a plan to use them. I have advised both clients to donate their supplies if they don't pick these hobbies up again in the next six months. So we've talked about how stuff comes in. So why do we hang on to it? Why do we keep it? Well, guilt. A while back, I bought this dress. It looked so good in the catalog. I could see myself wearing it to conference, uh, maybe to church, out to dinner. It was a lot more money than I usually spend on a dress, but I thought, I'm worth it. Let's get it. I ordered it. It came. I put it on and I felt frumpy. Mm. And I thought, oh gosh, I spent so much money on this thing. Maybe if I just lose 10 pounds, it'll hang a little better and I'll be able to enjoy it. Well, that didn't happen. I held on to it for so long, I could now not even return it. I've spent so much money on it. And I was mad at myself because I forgot to notice or pay attention when I ordered it, that it was being modeled by someone who was probably about a size two and 20 years old, and I'm in my 70s and overweight. So every time I looked at that, I felt guilty because I'd spent so much money on it. Well, obviously, eventually I got rid of it. I got tired of hitting myself about the head and shoulders, but guilt made me hold on to it for a long time. Then there's obligation. Uh, I was working with a client for several years and one of her goals was to take a room and make it into an exercise room. And she had all the stuff laid out to do that. She had her, her bike, she had her mat, she had her weight, she had her band, she was gonna put up a mirror. But inside this room was a large organ. Now you couldn't tell it was an organ because she had a blanket over. And I'm going like, why are we keeping this in this room? Uh, we, we need the space. You, you don't play the organ. Your husband doesn't play the organ. You have no intention of playing the organ. Can't we just move this out? Oh no, it was my grandmother's. And I can remember she had such a passion with this. She would love to play it. And I just feel like I cannot, I cannot get rid of it. And I'm like, well, do you maybe have a picture of your grandmother with the organ? Yes, but, but I just, it just doesn't feel right to get rid of this. I just doesn't. 
Well, I, I dug around some more and about a year later, I found a gentleman who really would love to have that organ and he would fix it up and he would use it. And he had a passion for it. So I did convince her that her passion was exercising, not the organ, not playing the organ, which was like her grandmother's. Her grandmother would not want her to give up her passion to make room for something that was no longer a passion. And so she did give it away and yay her. Another reason we keep on to things is fear. I was working with a client setting up a room in the basement that was going to be her hobby room. And there were a lot of boxes in there. And I said, what's, what's in the boxes? And she said, well, I've got some trophies and I've got some plaques. I've got paperwork and letters of recommendation, commendation to me because I was very, very active in a lot of organizations. And she was well known. I mean, she botanical gardens and, and she still worked in some of them. But I'm saying, we well, are not displaying them. Why are you keeping them? Well, I'm afraid that if I let them go, people will forget who I was. I want my children, even my grandchildren, to remember that I was somebody. Well, this bothered me on a couple of levels. First of all, she still is somebody. She's important, she's loved. But to keep all of that just for the fear that she would lose her identity. I tried to convince her just to save a few, maybe take pictures of the others, but I don't think she bought it. Then there's the fear of, well, it might be worth something. If I just give it away, it's like giving away money. I mean, this could be valuable. I mean, this was my grandmother's china. We have some great grandmother's china in here, which came from England. Uh, it, it, it could be worth something. Well, I said, well, let's think about it. You're not using it. So if you want to sell it to get the money, uh, you know, you're going to have to get it out, clean it up, take pictures of it, list it on a site. If somebody buys it, ship it off. Think how much time all this is going to take. What's your time worth? Uh, as organizers, we, we see a lot of China collections, collectible plates, and people always think that they have so much value. And it's really difficult to get rid of a lot of this stuff because people don't want them. If you really think it might be a good piece of bone china from, from England, get it to an appraiser. But otherwise, come on. Then there's the fear of scarcity. You remember when we first went into this pandemic and everybody was, things got scarce. So we bought, when we found something, we bought it up. I mean, you know, I know that a closet full of toilet paper is excessive, but what if we have a shortage again? I may need this. I'll be glad I have that toilet paper then. Mm -hmm, come see me. Or the dried beans, and I don't even cook. But hey, if I get starving, I can do something with these. And the other items I've stockpiled. Fear often makes us hold on to things that we really don't need and we really don't love. We're supposed to be going towards a more paperless society, but I for one love paper. I know Jonda does too. I write my lists on paper. I love the action of checking something off on, on my list or putting a line through it. And actually, um, you probably know this, but I'll tell you anyway to remind you, the physical act of writing something on paper helps to imprint it in your mind. And I do use that as a memory technique. I use a paper planner. And we heard from Jonda earlier some of the ways paper comes into our home. Why does it linger? It lingers because we don't make decisions about it. We bring it in, we put it down, 
and then like a magnet, more paper sticks to it. And before you know it, we have a pile of paper. Barbara Hempel, another professional organizer, says that clutter is the result of postponed decisions. I have to agree with her, particularly as it applies to paper. Many of us are afraid of making the wrong decision about paper. One of my clients doesn't like to open her mail because she's afraid she won't understand the contents. So she's decided that if she doesn't open the envelope, she won't have to try to figure out what to do next. And honestly, that's the one of the things that uh, she and I do together. I open the mail so that we can figure out together what to make decisions on. Fear is one of the driving forces that keeps paper hanging around our homes in piles and in files. Did you know that 80% of the paper we keep, we will never ever refer to again? We truly only need and reference about 20% of the papers we keep. So what should we keep? The most important ones are of course, those vital documents, your marriage license, your birth certificate, um, death certificates are also important, insurance papers, all the things that serve to identify not only who you are, but also what you own. What about other papers? Some we keep because we think we're going to be very organized and put those papers to use. We think we will sort through and find all the receipts for our morning coffee, our haircuts, groceries, dinners out. We're going to find these receipts, organize them, and then create a beautiful budget. We'll know where we can cut some expenses and where we have a little bit of extra that we can spend. Is this realistic? I think not, but somehow those papers linger. I know some of them are stuffed into the bottom of handbags. Maybe they're in a tote bag, maybe in the uh, grocery sack that you bring home from the grocery store, possibly even in a coat pocket or stashed in a bowl on the counter. My advice is to gather all of those receipts and just trash them. If you want to know how you're spending your money, go online and check the digest of your credit card. Hold on to the receipts for big ticket items because these receipts will sometimes include warranty information and you can use them on when you go to create a home inventory, but that is a topic for another day. I used to clip articles related to gardening and in particular um, orchids. I don't clip articles anymore because I know I can find the most up-to-date information online. But if you print information, for instance, if you're going on a trip and you print information about any um, tourist information, when you get home from that trip, you can trash that information because the prices will change Tourist attraction times sometimes change depending on the time of the year. And then um, restaurant names change, all sorts of things change. So don't hold on to that stuff. Just get rid of it when you get home. Now, if you happen to find an article in a magazine and you're finished with the rest of the magazine, consider tearing that article out and putting it in a folder. You can carry that folder with you to the doctor's office, for instance, and then sit and read it while you wait. Or if you pick your children up um, in your car and you have to wait in a carpool line, read the article then. That's a great use of your time and maybe will stop you scrolling through your phone. I know it's temp tempting to hold on to all sorts of papers, but as you go about decluttering your home, Evaluate the papers and ask yourself if this will be part of the 
that you'll never reference again or the 20% that you will. So why can't we let things go? Think about gifts again. <clears throat> Remember that teapot? Aha, you better believe I'm gonna have to keep that teapot for a while. Probably gonna have to use it the next time she comes over. Then maybe I'll have it displayed on a shelf. Later on, I may put it in a cupboard and eventually it might be able to go out. I was working with a client when we were going through some boxes that hadn't been opened since the last move. And we came across a music box with a little ballerina on the top. And I'm like, okay, I'm curious. This is so not you. Where did that come from? And then why have you kept it? She said, well, it was a gift that my grandmother gave me for Christmas when I was 10. And she gave one to my sister too. I, I know it doesn't suit me at all, but she says, you know, it was from my grandmother. And I'm going, well, didn't your grandmother give you other things that you really liked? Well, yes. Well, then let this one go and let some other little girl enjoy it. She says, I can let it go? I said, yes. So gifts, once they're yours, you can let them go. And then we have this someday thinking. I may need this sometime. I know I have three or four or five, six, seven of these, but I may need it sometime. I love the rule that the minimalists put out. And the min minimalists, if you haven't heard of them, are Joshua Fields Milborn and Ryan Nicodemus, and they call themselves the minimalists. Diane and I heard them speak at a NAPO conference a few years back. And their 2020 rule is one that I hung on to and share a lot. And this rule says, that if you can get an item again within 20 minutes, hello, Amazon, and it's under $20, just get rid of it now. My clients will say, but I've already paid for it. I already have it. Why should I get rid of it? Well, you've got, you'd like to have some more space, wouldn't you? If you would get rid of 50 items in your house, and let's say that someday you do have to go back and buy two. You are way ahead. So um, let me tell you about my disorganization. It has three main or defining features. It's chronic, meaning that the disorganization, sort of like a headache that won't go away, persists. And there's no thought that the person will ever be as organized as they think they want to be. The disorganization has an impact on their quality of life. They may lose things like their wallet, their keys, a folder for a presentation. They are probably always running just a little bit late or behind schedule. Maybe they feel like they're never quite caught up with everything that they want to do. The disorganization also has an impact on their relationships with their spouse or partner or their work or their coworkers. There's a feeling of being overwhelmed by all that they have to do and their stuff. And they have tried and tried multiple times to get organized and never quite succeeded. Quite often when Jonda and I visit the home of someone challenged by chronic disorganization, we find lots of organizing books here, there and everywhere scattered throughout their home. And quite often our books are included in these piles. So chronic disorganization is a weight for the person who is challenged by it. They really feel it. Very often this person also has either diagnosed or undiagnosed ADHD, and that is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. What should they let go of first? They don't know, so they procrastinate and they don't let go of anything. They can't make a decision. What would be the right thing to let go of? Well, there are all sorts of reasons to let go of one thing 
or let go of another thing, but then there are reasons to keep them too. So what's the right thing to do? They don't know. So let's create a mythical person. And we're going to have this person organize the top of the chest of drawers. Now that seems like a very reasonable thing to do. It's a small space, it's defined. It's the, just the only the top, none of the drawers, just the very top of the chest of drawers. And this person thinks that they will probably come across something that they can get rid of and it probably won't take them that long to do. So they start. They start on one end of the top of the chest of drawers and they find a half empty can of soda. Well, they know that doesn't belong there. So they take it into the bathroom to pour the rest of the contents down the sink. While they're there, they notice this really pretty pink nail polish that their friend gave them for Christmas. So they decide to try it, but not on all their nails, just on one nail. All their nails would take too much time. They know they don't have a lot of time because they're going to have to go pick their daughter up from school, but they, they want to try this. So they'll try it on one nail, but to do that, they have to remove the nail polish on that one nail. Okay, so they're going to look under the sink for a cotton ball and the nail polish remover just to remove the polish on one nail. But they look under the sink and they discover their hairbrush, which has been missing for several days now. They can't imagine what the hairbrush is doing under the sink. They know it doesn't belong there. So they take it back to their chest of drawers and put it down and they think, now what was I doing? Oh yes, I was, I was going to see um, about organizing the top of my chest of drawers and what can I let go of? They look up and they notice the time. Oh my goodness, so much time has passed. I'm late now getting my daughter um, from school. I have to get in the car and go wait in that carpool line and I'm hoping that I'm not the last car. Nothing has happened. Nothing has been accomplished. Just removing that one can of soda. This is one of the reasons it's very hard for someone to, um, challenged by chronic disorganization to get organized and to let things go. They get distracted, overwhelmed, frustrated, anxious, and sometimes depressed that they will never ever be able to get anything organized. The second code word, <laughs> the second code word is trigger, T-R-I-G-G-E-R. -G -G -E Too much stuff can trigger overwhelm, trigger. So knowing your reasons why, sometimes there are triggers that tell you it is time to let go of this stuff. And one of those triggers is moving. When it's time to move, this is the perfect time to look around and say, what do I not need? What do I not love? And what do I not want to pay to move? This is a time that you make, ask yourself these questions. It doesn't make sense to pay to move things that you don't need. You say, how much a pound does it cost? Plus, you know, the box, the tissue, the labor. Does it make sense to move? partially used office supplies, spices that are about ready to go, the piece of furniture that's been in the attic that I haven't used. And then you think about the place where you're going, the placement of the furniture in the new place. You probably have a floor plan. Where are things going to go when I do move them? When I moved almost nine years ago, I had a professional organizer help me decide what to take and what to let go of. And she would point out to me, yes, I know you love that table. Yes, I know you love that piece of furniture, but you do not have any place in your new home to put it unless you're going to stop, you know, replace it with something you've already decided you want to move. And I, I needed that. <laughs> I needed that, that 
calmness telling me, you don't want to move this. And then does it match your vision for your new home? Often when people move, they, they have sort of, I want to change things up a little bit. So don't move things that are not going to fit your new vision. Is it going to crowd your space? Maybe you want to keep the love seat, but let go of the sofa. Another trigger is poor health or changing your health. In the past few years, I've had arthritis problems and it's really limited my mobility, uh, especially in the kitchen. I can't reach high, I can't get down low. So I've had to get rid of some things in my kitchen and reposition things in my kitchen so that I can reach them. Poor mobility issues can also make you rethink about maybe it's time now to get rid of the throw rugs. And I certainly need to get rid of anything that is blocking my progress of walking through halls uh, so that I can accommodate at least a walk or maybe even a wheelchair. Another trigger might be your situation in life has changed. Hey, the kids moved out, finally. Now I can take that room of theirs and empty it out of the stuff they didn't take and make it into a craft room or maybe that office I've always wanted. It can still double as a room for them to sleep in when they come. I can keep a bed in there or maybe put in a Murphy bed. And that ping pong table in the basement can finally go. Never was my thing. Takes up a lot of room. Maybe you're single again. Your significant other or spouse has moved out, probably taken some of their stuff with them, probably left some of their junk behind. Now's the time, let's get rid of that stuff, make more room for you. And maybe there has been a death in the family. When the time is right, this might be the time now to say, I don't need that extra desk. I don't need that extra set of drawers. I don't need to keep sports and hobby equipment that's not mine. Let's let somebody else enjoy that. Sometimes it's, it's just a shift in your mind. It's how you think. You look around and you see all this stuff now crowding your house and you think, I just want less stuff. When we first start housekeeping, we don't have much and we accumulate and we're so proud of ourselves. We can finally buy some of that good china, silver, crystal, a leather sectional sofa, jewelry, you name it. But then you reach a point in your life and you look around and you think, this stuff is really beginning to crowd my space and is costing me money. As for space, I mean, back to me in the kitchen, I needed to make space to work with what I used all the time. I needed to reduce the amount of things I had so that I could continue to cook. The same thing would be true with your closet, your pantry. If you get rid of a lot of the extra stuff, it makes it so much easier to get and use what you need and you really love. And then that money component of it, if you have things of high value, like really valuable jewelry or high-end electronics, you probably have a writer on your insurance that you're paying for. Or if you actually have so much stuff that it's not even fitting in your home anymore, you may be having a storage facility that you're paying monthly for just so you can get that extra stuff out of your way. Maybe you're thinking, I would like to have more free time. Everything you own takes up some of your time. You need to clean it, you need to dust it, you need to polish it. Wouldn't it be more fun to go out for lunch with a friend? Now my life got simpler when I got rid of my good china and my sterling silver. Now when I entertain or give parties, I just use my everyday stuff and it can go in the dishwasher. And it saves me so much time and stress getting ready for a party. Even small stuff 
takes up our time, even new stuff. We buy something new. It, what's the packaging it comes in? We have to make a decision about that. Is it recyclable? Is it trash? Uh, am I gonna keep the box? I may wanna store it in again. Then we have to find a place to put it. And then we have it now, so we have to clean it. And then maybe later we're going to have to mend it. Or then maybe we're going to have to find replacement parts for it. All of this takes up time. And not to forget the time that we lose looking for our stuff that gets buried in all of our stuff. Americans spend an average of 2.5 days a year just looking for their misplaced stuff. So many benefits to downsizing and moving closer to family. Benefits for you and benefits for the family. Let's say I move closer to my son. In this case, it would mean moving closer to the, my son who has the grandchildren and is in Connecticut. I would get to attend school plays and concerts. I could take the grandchildren to the playground. I would be much more of a presence in my grandchildren's life. And then if they were if they needed to stay home from school because my son and daughter-in-law both work, um, I would be able to be there and take care of them. The benefit would also be mine because if I needed to rearrange furniture, for instance, and I love to rearrange furniture in my house, my son and daughter-in-law could come over and help me. If I needed to put something into the basement or up into the attic, they could help me with that too. And if I were sick, they could go, one of them could go with me to the doctor and be that extra set of ears to listen to what the doctor is saying. So those are just the benefits of moving closer to family. Another benefit to um, downsizing, whether you move or you downsize and stay in place, is that you're reducing what you own. And reducing what you own actually minimizes the stress that your body feels. Creating open space in your home reduces the level of anxiety that you feel and your stress. Because even though things don't actually talk to us, we can't hear what, what they are saying, obviously, because they don't have a voice. The fact that we are seeing all this stuff creates noise in our head, telling us that we need to do something about the pile we could trip over, something about the furniture that's in the way, something to open the um, passageway so that just in case a gurney had to get through, there would be enough width in the path for a gurney to pass. So even though these are inanimate objects, they create chatter. And when you reduce the amount of things in your home, you reduce the excess noise, and then you minimize the stress that you feel. So now what? We are ready to get rid of our stuff. What's the next step? How do you begin? I think it's very important to know your why, because if you know your why, it helps you make these decisions. Are you doing this because you want to age out in place? Are you getting rid of stuff because you want to maintain uh, your home with less effort and you want more free time? Are you getting rid of stuff because you're moving to a smaller space? Knowing why you are downsizing your stuff helps you to know what needs to go. About nine years ago, I got married and my new husband and I each sold our homes and moved into an our home that we plan on aging out in. Now, each of us had a very full home of stuff. So we had to have this conversation. It was a process. Who had the better cookware? Who had the better vacuum cleaner? How much artwork could we bring? And whose? 
And how would each room be used in our new home? Even though I'm a professional organizer, we each hired a professional organizer to assist us working through these questions. Asking yourself these questions will help you decide what you want to let go of so that you end up with your desired end result. But how do you make this happen? We've answered the question, how did I end up with so much stuff? We've talked about why things stay in the home. We've even touched on why it's difficult to remove things from our home. Now it's time to get down to the nitty gritty and talk about the steps you or someone you know can take to make it happen. One of our best strategies is to begin with the end in mind. We call it backwards planning. You decide when you want to be finished working on this project. We advise setting small, measurable, actionable, realistic, and timely goals or benchmarks. These are SMART goals. If, for instance, you want to tackle downsizing your whole home because you're moving, set small goals targeting one room at a time. If you have six months, maybe or maybe give or take in which to do this, decide how many weeks you want to dedicate to each room. Plot those dates into your calendar. Honestly, take out a calendar, a planner, a journal, and make notes about the room in, um, you, in which you are working. What's the next to last room? And so on, until you reach the room or area that you will start with. Do you need help? Are you going to hire a moving company to pack you? Do you wanna work with a professional organizer who can help keep you focused on the task and guide you to release some of your belongings? Some professional organizers also pack boxes and facilitate moves. A professional organizer can help you figure out what will or will not, as John does said, fit in your new home, and then how to divest yourself of the furniture which remains. If you find you have many things that you want to let go, consider contacting Max Soul to sell these things for you. When will you contact a real estate agent? If you're selling your home and moving, do you need to schedule any repairs or improvements to give you a bigger profit? Use your calendar to schedule these phone calls and tasks. When you write things down and schedule them, you do two things. You remove it from your mind so you don't need to worry about remembering. And the information has been captured. You know when it will happen. You can also set reminders in your phone to prompt you to act. If you're not moving, but downsizing in place, use backwards planning to reduce the amount of stuff in your home and reduce your stress. So as we wrap up this call, this talk, we want you to remember a few main points. It's very important to think through the ways in which things come into your home. Before bringing anything new in, Think about these things. Do you need it? Will it serve a purpose? Do you already have something similar? Are you willing to say goodbye or part with something you already have to make room for the thing you're bringing in? You know that your home is not expandable. It's not like the waistband on your yoga pants that will stretch as you expand or contract a little bit. Our closets don't um, provide more space because we want to bring more things in. If you can find a place to display something, great. Otherwise, admire it from afar, take a picture. And then if you decide you have room, go back and get it. Take time to think through your vision for your home. 
communicate that vision to your friends and family. Let them know how much you value them and love spending time with them. Talk to them about gifts. Tell them that, they, that you appreciate them thinking about you. And you may want to ask them to ask you before they bring anything new to you as a gift. You may suggest that spending time together, creating memories together is the greatest gift that they can give you. And truthfully, the best thing to have in our homes is the feeling that this is the place that we can go to rest, relax, and be at peace. Make space in your homes for peace. Our final code word for this presentation is downsizing. Downsizing helps reduce your stress. Downsizing, D-O-W-N-S-I-Z-I-N-G, downsizing. We have a couple of resource slides with um, our products, our books, resources that we have used for this presentation and how to get in touch with us. Over Excellent. You. Thank you so much, Diane and Jonda, for your time today and for all of that amazing and very useful information. Um, we can take a few questions. We're just at about the end. Um, I, I've gotten a lot of questions in the chat about the recording. And yes, you can email me directly for a request. And I put my email in here a couple times. It's heather.dawson at maxold.com. Also, the recording will be on maxold.com's resource page, which is at the menu at the top of our website. You can find uh, past webinar recordings there as well. Um, and it will also be on our Facebook homepage also. Um, just give it a little while to get uploaded into those areas. It should be there by the morning for sure. And um, we did have a question about the name of the children's organizing book, Diane and Jonda. What was that book? Um, there are two books. Susie's Messy Room is one more geared a little bit more towards girls. And Benji's Messy Room is the second book. Okay, perfect. Um, and then also, let's see, I wanted to let everybody know, just a reminder, if you're a NAPO organizer, that you can get a reduced commission on any sales from Max Sold right now. That goes on through February 18th. Uh, the code is go NAPO for your contracts. I'm going to just post that in the chat for anybody that would need it. Also, I'm going to be at the summit. I would really love to meet anybody else that's going to be there. So, you know, send me an email and maybe we can get coffee. Oh, are those books on Amazon, Diane, the children's books? Yes, they are available on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, oh, and we do have a question here that is, uh, do you use the term hoarding ever? Is that a triggering word? Um, and there was another question that I'd seen about that also. So maybe you could talk a little bit about hoarding and how that fits in. Sure. Um, Shonda, do you want to start us off? Or? Okay, so we don't like to use the word hoarding by itself. We say uh, someone has uh, tendencies towards it or uh, uh, hoarding-like behaviors. We never say that a person is a hoarder. That's a label. And also it's a medical diagnosis that we're not allowed, would not want to give. But we do use it as a person with hoarding tendencies. Uh, so it, it, our book uh, deals with that on uh, filled up and overflowing and the use of labels. Sometimes a home, if I can just chime in a little bit, sometimes um, a home can be so full that it looks like hoarding because there are piles of things that are not organized or categorized and they are just all over the place. But when it comes right down to it, if the person is willing to go through and sort and release things that are 
no longer, they can't use them anymore or they're broken or there's sort of trash mixed in there. Um, to uh, reduce the piles, then it is truly not hoarding. So we're very careful when we talk about hoarding because as John just said, it is a medical diagnosis, but um, homes can become filled up, filled up with collections of things. Does that, uh, does that help? It, yes, she said yes. Um, perfect. Okay, uh, another question from the Facebook thread. How do I enlist my family to be actively involved in this process? So um, that's a, a great question. And we have a product which actually involves the entire family. Uh, oh, you can um, you can use our book filled up and overflowing. There are there uh, chapters in there with deal that deal with engaging your family. And then we also have um, our organize your home ten minutes at a time deck of cards, which um, they're they're small tasks, ten minutes at a time, and some of the tasks are child friendly, so you can engage your children. In, um, in helping to remove things. But if you're talking about emptying, for instance, children's closets, children who've already moved out, emptying their things, then I would give them a timeline. Either they come and get their things or those things are going to be donated, trashed or removed one way or another from the house. Jonda has a good story about that. Her mother gave everybody a timeline, didn't they? Didn't she? She certainly did, and she meant it, and we knew it. <laughs> you know, in other words, you have six weeks or six months to come and get your things from the house, and, and if that time has gone by and you haven't come to collect all your sports equipment or your clothes, comic book collection, comic book collection, then, um, then off it goes. <laughs> Looking to see if we have any more questions. We are right a little over time. Um, last call for questions. I think that's it. Thank you so much again, Diana and Jonda. And do you want to recap the code words um, just so that everybody knows? Sure. The first word was stuff. S T U F F. Second word trigger. T R I G G E R. Last word downsizing. D O W N S I Z I N G. Perfect. Thank you so much again, and everybody have a great afternoon. Bye. Bye.